Um, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, kind of where people look in images, where your gaze is sort of directed to when you look at an image, um, and some of the applications of this kind of thing. Um, so to first of all, to kind of motivate this, as in why, why, do we, why do we care about this in the first place, I want to show this, this kind of uh, image here. I'll just take a quick look of it, and then I'll take it, take it away, and then I'll show it again, okay? If something has changed in that image. Um, I don't know if anybody here spotted it. Anybody spot what the change was? I'll do it again, all right, look closely. Anyone see? Okay, so watch this bar here as, as, as I uh, change it, okay? See, it's moved down, all right? Let's try another one. Here's another image here, have a, have a quick look. Anyone see the change? Oh, go back. Okay, look at the reflection. It's gone. So. <laughs> So we think we see everything in the image, right? When we look at it, we have this illusion that we're actually seeing the entire picture, but we're not. We're only focusing on very specific parts of it, the salient parts, and our brain just fills in the rest with convincing looking content. You can think of it as having a little generative adversarial network in the back of your head that's generating realistic looking content there. We're not actually seeing it. That's not actually what you're seeing. Um, yeah, we, so we don't really see the only, uh, whole image. We mainly focus on some, some small specific regions. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that we don't always focus on different specific regions. Actually, we're quite reliably drawn to the same kind of things when we look at an image. These are called the salient regions. Uh, so just back to this picture here, we perceive this, right? We think we see everything. We think we see all of this detail around. But if, if you actually measure where people look, um, they reliably look in these, these same locations, which I've highlighted here with a heat map, or this is called a saliency map. Um, and actually, this particular saliency map is, is a generated one, not actually a, um, a human one, but it's exactly the same, almost exactly the same as what a human would, would what, what you would get from monitoring where humans look. Um, so this is what we actually see, right? So we, we see lots of resolution in the areas that we focus on, but we only focus on a small number of areas, and, and the rest of it is a set, sort of, we, we don't think we see these sort of things because this is unrealistic content. Our brain fills it in with more realistic content. We don't actually see it. Okay, so a uh, question that might come up then is, right, well, if, if people reliably look in the same place, is there some way of us being able to predict where they look? Like, can we model it in some way? Um, and yeah, people have been trying to do this for a while, and, and there's been lots of different approaches. Deep learning approaches predictably seem to work the best, and people have started doing this in the last couple of years. So uh, yeah, we can, we can model this pretty well. But let's, let's say we have a model of it, what, why is that uh, useful? So just, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about some applications later, but you might want to keep it in the back of your head as what, what might you want to do with this, this stuff. Uh, so just show a couple of models um, for, for predicting saliency. So this is one that we um, had at CVPR um, last year. Um, it was one of the, the first sort of neural networks applied to this kind of task. So what we did was we, we had a, it's a, Pretty simple uh, feed-forward, fully convolutional network. You've seen these for, for semantic segmentation before. It's just convolutions all the way down. Um, there's sort of two pooling layers, so we get about a quarter resolution by the time we get up down here. So we have to do this deconvolution, which kind of takes something smaller and makes it bigger again to get the, the this output the same size as the input. Um, and we trained this, and we did a couple of things. We first of all did some transfer learning, so we copied these layers here, first three from VGG, that seems to help a lot because they're kind of already good low level features for images that are, that are useful for you know, all sorts of classification tasks, so we expect them to be useful here. And then we, we basically initialize these layers randomly and, and we, we uh, fine tuned it. And we use this a data set called Salicon, which is an interesting data set. It's one of the reasons it is possible to do deep learning on this stuff. So beforehand there was all these eye tracking data sets, but they're quite small because it's expensive to run eye trackers on many, many people, right? So you want to collect thousands of different people and stuff like that. So you, with eye trackers, you generally have to bring them into a lab and sit them down and run the eye tracker. Um, but these guys um, who created the Salicon data set observed that what you could do is you could use um, artificial foveation, which is where instead of using an eye tracker, you just get a person to move the mouse around the image to where they look at. And you sort of blur everywhere else except for where it's under their cursor. And then they kind of correlated this to where people look and does it, does it seem to be similar? And they found that, yeah, it is very similar. So they created a sort of simulated data set using Amazon Mechanical Turk, and that was big enough for us to train a model on. Uh, so this is just some of the results of what you get from, from some images there. So images on the top, this middle sort of row is the ground truth. This is what, where people actually did look when you 
So, you know, do this with multiple people, then you average the results. And then this is our prediction at the bottom, so you can see it matches pretty well uh, the ground truth. And these are slightly more complicated scenes, so, you know, there's multiple people in the scene and it, it tends to focus on where the people are. This one's particularly complicated, there's lots of traffic lights and things, but it still seems to get a reasonably, reasonably good result. Um, so that, that work was um, in the top five on the MIT benchmark for a while, but um, it's since been, a lot of other people started to do this, so it's since gone down. So we've, we've got an, a new approach now uh, where we extended basically the idea. Uh, so we have a fully convolutional network here. It's bigger this time, so usually when you want to improve things, you make it bigger. Um, and then we used a different type of cost function, but this this case we also used uh, the idea of an adversary, as adversarial loss or adversarial training, I guess, um, when we were uh, training the network. So I spoke about this yesterday. So the, the idea is that you have this, these predictions and we also have an adversary kind of learning how to tell, conditioned on the image. So this is you know, similar to the, the, the things I showed yesterday. Conditioned on the image, what's a good saliency map, right? And it's sort of learning a dynamic loss function as you're going along. And it can pick up on certain th types of things that would give it away as being a, you know, not a really, like, not a statistically convincing saliency map, right? And the idea is, when we trained with this, we got better results. So, um, yeah. So this was this is this is a, this benchmark changes all the time. So I don't know if, how current it is, but this was our SalNet one, and this is our SalGAN one. Uh, there's a couple of other approaches. One of the other ones that came quite early on is is Salicon. So these are the guys who who came up with that data set. They also came up with an algorithm as well, or a model. Um, and the kind of innovative thing here is that they, have, they do, do a sort of coarse and fine approach, right? So you have, you have the sa same neural network applied to a small image and a big image, and then you have some, you know, concatenation of these two things. So you're looking at, at sort of at different resolutions at the same time. And then they also use a bunch of different uh, types of objectives, and they find it, you know, using, I think it was a KL divergence seems to work, work best in them. Um, Another model is this ML net or multi multi level net. So this is pretty similar to what we did, what, what, what we seen on the last one, except that they actually take the multiple scales from the same network by just using, you know, the same size image, but taking features from different layers, concatenating them all together, and doing some convolutions, one by one convolution. Some of the innovation here is they have this learned prior. So you know, there's this sort of these weights that are going to get multiplied with all of these these things coming out here, and, and, and it learns them as well, just using backpropagation in the same way as you learn learn anything else. So uh, this kind of gives you sort of I don't know if it makes sense to say a learn prior, but that's what, what they call it. So um, and then there's like this is probably the most complicated one that's this out there, and probably one of the best performing ones as well. So there's a lot going on here. This is the deep fix network. Um, so the the top sort of segment here down to this part here. Is basically the VGG16 network, uh, and they use transfer learning to get copy the weights from that. Then they didn't want to to be as low resolution as what would come out with the VGG16 network, so they they replaced these sort of pooling parts here and strided parts with with um, dilated convolutions. That gives you a bigger receptive field without actually reducing the resolution. And dilated convolutions, if you haven't seen them before. Convolutions were holes in them, basically. So you're just kind of skipping over some pixels when you when you when you look at the filters. Then they have inception layers, which uh, Chavi mentioned these before. These are these sort of multi-resolution layers where you look at the images are sort of analyzed at different sort of spatial resolutions. So you have three by three, um, three by three kernels, strided three by three kernels, and you got something that does max pooling and then then sort of uh, convolution as well. So you're kind of again trying to do this multi-scale. Thing um, and then they have these these interesting location-based convolutions where they basically take the outputs of all of this, and then they concatenate some sort of fixed filters on them that sort of tell you where you are in the image, given the the convolutions an opportunity to take advantage of the location that they're in when they're doing this um, doing it so not location-based location-biased convolutions, and then it's just a normal convolution layer and that, that produces the output. So this this performs very well. They trained this with Euclidean loss. Um, and it's one of the best performing ones at the moment. I think, the, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's here, so it's pretty good. Um, okay, so I think, like, there's a whole, like, kind of thing now where people are compu competing to get the top of these benchmarks and things like that. But uh, um, the other thing I think is more interesting is what can we actually do with all of this stuff? Because 
we don't actually, you know, just because you're getting point zero one better in the benchmark, is, is that like a lot of effort for nothing? Is it, are the models just good enough already to do something interesting with? So I just want to talk about some of the applications of this, because um, I think these are, these are probably something useful to look at now as well. It's something we're very interested in. Uh, so one of the first ones that we, we looked at was intelligent image cropping. It seems like the most obvious thing to do with this, and it, and it works quite well. Uh, so we did this in conjunction with the Irish Times, which is a newspaper in Ireland. Um, and what we did was basically run the saliency detection on the image and then take the... So what they... What, well, to just to define the, pro the problem, they, they target lots of different media. So they've got print and they've got, you know, an iPhone and they've got a, your desktop and your tablet and things like that. And all of these tend to need a different aspect ratio in the images. So what they do at the moment is they go in and they just manually crop them all. But they have to do this for hundreds of images every day and it's kind of tedious. And most of the crops, they said, were like just really mechanical. It's not like, you know, it's just get the most interesting part of it and put it in there. So this kind of thing is, is perfect for this, right? So we just take the largest, the crop with the largest amount of saliency in it, right? That, that fits the right aspect ratio. Um, and that, that tends to work really well. So for that kind of image there, you get the, the crop there. So it realizes faces are salient, you know, it realizes objects like this are salient and things like that. So it works, it works quite well. And this is um, used in production at the Irish Times at the moment. And I think it's about 90% of the images that go through this system are, are used. Occasionally, you know, they really want something specific and they have to do it themselves because there's no, you know, this doesn't, can't read your mind or anything like that. It just takes out the most interesting part. Um, another one I don't want to spend too much time on now because uh, we're going to talk about retrieval in, in another few sessions. But this is, uh, we try to use this for image retrieval as well. So, okay, we can use these agency maps. Is there anything we can do with them to make retrieval better? Um, and I'll define retrieval and stuff in, in later on. Um, so this was a, a system that we had for retrieval. Again, I'll, I'll go into this later on, but I mean, I think the only part you really need to think about now is we have some sort of local representation of the image, right? So it's divided up into these sort of blocks, and in each block we have a description of the local content there. Um, and we, we had a, we, particular ways of encoding that using bag of words got us very good results last year. Um, and since then we've, we've sort of taken our saliency models and, you know, you can get a, a, like a, an idea of where people look in the image and if you just do importance weighting so just multiply you know the saliency by the features um, it works really well before before you do any kind of pooling um, so this is the kind of improvements that you get which is quite quite good especially on data sets like Instra where right, so you get a, you get an improvement on data sets like Oxford where you know even if you're looking at uh, if you look at the images in Oxford right it's, it's buildings right they're big they take up the whole image nearly and they're, they're in the middle right um, so saliency weighting isn't isn't that important although it does help um, in Instra you may have very very different size objects and, and uh, the saliency weighting really helps there so you know you go from 0.472 to you know 0.617 and then when you add some query expansion up to 0.719 so it's, it's a very sizable improvement these are mean average precision figures by the way um, and we also tried to use it for classification as well, so we did ImageNet with it, and then we just added some saliency as, a, as another input. So we have a little bit of a thing to process the saliency first, and then we put it in here. And this is a kind of an AlexNet style architecture, and we've seen a, a good improvement in, in accuracy when you, when you do that as well. Um, and I guess you might ask what, why it improves accuracy. So if you visualize some of the examples, like volleyball is a good one, you can see that it tends to focus on the on the ball and the hands and things, and these are the kind of things that, you know, you, you need to classify volleyball, right? You need to see that there's a net and a ball in the air and people kind of hitting it. So it kind of up weights these sort of, or at least it gives the, the network more information on the, what, the, what to focus on, what's important for, for these kind of things. These are the, are the ones that improved the most. I mean, some of them didn't improve, some of them got worse, but on, on the whole it improved accuracy. But, uh, yeah. Okay, that's everything. Any questions?